All right, everybody, here is a. Uh, I got pigs. I have this type of pig. They're just so darn cute. I thought maybe I'd flash a quick picture of my piggies before we get back to the task at hand, finishing out our discussion of blood. I'm starting here our second part of the video on slide number 24. White blood cells, also known as leukocytes, can be broken down into these five families neutrophils lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. And so the mnemonic, the memory device we can use to remember those is never let mama eat beans. You know what happens, people. We all suffer. So what does that tell us? Well, in a normal and healthy patient, they should have more neutrophils than lymphocytes and more lymphocytes than monocytes and so on. So you don't have to memorize these numbers. You'll learn the clinical values in your clinical classes, probably in pathology first. But 60% uh, of your circulating white blood cells are neutrophils, and less than 1% are basophils. White blood cells are involved in immune and allergy, like we had talked about in our first video. And so it's sort of strange, but they are not anchored down, ladies and gentlemen, like so many of our cells, muscle and bone and skin that are fixed in place white blood cells are travelers they are vagabonds they move around and so they move through a couple of different processes through an amoeboid amoeboid movement which is crawling they sort of throw parts of the cell forward into these false feet or pseudopods they also move through a process called diapedesis where they actually crawl through the blood cell wall, sort of like an exit ramp when they find where they need to leave. And then within the tissues, they move through a process called chemotaxis, like a taxi going towards a chemical. That's how I think of it. We can see those here in this image, uh, which I borrowed from a different textbook. Neutrophils in the bloodstream know where to leave to find a site of infection, like we see here. I'm on my farm, I get a sliver, it has microbes on it, suddenly I have a tiny infection in my skin, or maybe just below the epidermis. And then we see the uh, neutrophils move over to the edge, it's called margination. And then here's the diapedesis crawling through the endothelium. They use chemotaxis to hone in on these inflammatory chemicals. So look at that. It all starts with damaged tissue and those inflammatory chemicals like histamine can cause localized swelling and redness and they attract white blood cells through those processes we just discussed. Other formed elements, or, or rather uh, looking at those specific white blood cells in detail, neutrophils, lots of cool information here. I've tried to bold what I'd really like you to know. Neutrophils are bacteria fighters. The reason that's important is in a blood cell, sorry, a blood test called a CBC with differential. CBC stands for complete blood count, by the way. This blood test is commonly ordered by doctors to see if it's a bacterial or viral infection. And so if we see very elevated neutrophils well above that 70% margin, then the physician can be confident that it's a bacterial infection, and then they may be more likely to write a script for an antibiotic. If, on the other hand, the lymphocyte level is elevated above this 25% threshold, then we're thinking it's probably more of a viral infection, and the physician's more likely to be judicious or less likely to write a script for antibiotics. Moving down the line, eosinophils are most involved in parasites and some types of allergic reaction. We can see that both neutrophils and eosinophils contain these granules. They are filled with granules. It's a pun intended so that we can remember that these are the granulocytes along with the basophils, which are also full of granules. These ones contain histamine and heparin, and so these are involved in inflammatory responses and 
a lot of allergic reactions like hay fever and uh, those related to asthma, those types of inflammatory uh, allergies. Next, we have our agranulocytes, those which do not have granules, the lymphocytes and monocytes. Lymphocytes are virus fighters. I didn't put that on here, but I should have. Will you write that into your notes, please? Lymphocytes are viral fighters, and they're responsible for antibody production, uh, which can be the result of bacterial infection as well. Uh, monocytes become macrophages, which eat germs. And I call these the Incredible Hulk. Monocytes are the mild-mannered copy repairman guy who becomes the big Hulk when he gets mad. The monocytes are chill and they don't do too much until they find germs. Then they transform into these big, hungry Pac-Man cells, which can help to fight off infection. Platelets, our very last formed element. These are actually cell fragments, not cells themselves. Try saying that three times fast. The platelets are parts or portions of the megakaryocyte. So the megakaryocyte is never found in circulation. It's only in the bone marrow. And then as it begins to crawl out, it sort of breaks apart to give us these little platelets. Now, I think of platelets like the puffer fish from Finding Nemo. You remember that movie? In the dentist's office, there's this puffer fish who suffered from anxiety, which is not funny. But it is a lot like the way the platelets work. Um, the platelets are uh, smooth and slippery when they're inactive, but when they get stimulated, like the fish from Finding Nemo, poof, suddenly they become these little spiky puff balls that we see right here. So here's an inactive platelet, and then, oh my gosh, there's a cut, poof, they begin to stick together, and then, grab my hand, Jimmy, oh my gosh, and they start to form this little platelet plug which seals up the wound. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that's a preview of home um, hemostasis. Let me go back to what these little uh, activated platelets do. Not only do they stick together to form platelet plugs, but they secrete two important types of chemicals I need you to know about. Vasoconstrictors, which close the wound a little bit to reduce blood loss, and procoagulant or clotting factors. These chemicals trigger the formation of a fibrin clot to seal up the wound. Here are some other interesting and less important details. Place to pause. Let us reflect on the white blood cells, how they move, and how platelets are like puffer fish. Hit the pause button and uh, make sure you can answer these questions before you move on. Our next section is all about hemostasis. This means blood stoppage or the arrest of bleeding, right? If I cut myself in the kitchen and I begin to bleed, even if it's a small wound, I need to stop that bleeding. Not just because I'm gonna make a mess, but even a tiny, slow bleed can, over time, lead to significant blood loss and shock. And so through millions of years of evolution, we have evolved a very elegant way of stopping blood flow. These are the three phases, vascular spasm, platelet plug formation, and coagulation. And we can see them here on this image. In the kitchen, chopping onions, make a tiny cut onto my finger like I did last week. It bled for just a bit, but then the vascular spasm and the platelet plug closed it off. It was no longer bleeding, but for a few minutes it was sort of weeping fluid, right? That fluid was plasma. You can see here the platelet plug will prevent blood cells from leaking out, but the plasma fluid itself still leaks out, and so that's why blisters and uh, cuts in the process of stopping weep for just a little bit. What makes the clot waterproof and prevents the plasma from leaking out is this process called coagulation, the formation of a fibrin clot. By the way, all three of these pathways involve platelets, right? Platelet plug, vascular spasm from vasoconstrictors, 
and coagulation from those clotting factors. Okay, so how do we actually cause the fibrinogen, that soluble sort of invisible protein, to come out as these webs of fibrin? Well, it is a very complicated process that we can see here called coagulation. I've got my title lost here. Coagulation is uh, the process of activating fibrinogen factor one, a soluble, water-loving, invisible protein in our plasma to form these fibrin polymers, these threads. How do we turn that on? With thrombin, an enzyme which activates fibrinogen into fibrin. How do we turn thrombin from prothrombin with this factor 10? How do we turn on factor 10? Well, I'm glad you asked. One of two ways, the extrinsic mechanism, which is caused by tissues outside of the bloodstream being damaged, and the intrinsic mechanism, which is triggered by platelets. Look at that. Platelets secrete factor 12, which releases factor 11, which becomes factor 9, which activates factor 8. These were... Uh, Named in the order that they were discovered, not the order that they act. Oh, how painful. This is what makes it a four-credit college-level course. Ladies and gentlemen, do your best with flashcards to make a matching game or to make an unlabeled version of this image and then fill it in. Now, in reality, what percentage of the exam do you think will be on all of this stuff? really only a few questions so you got to weigh that cost benefit ratio how much time are you going to spend for just a few points but technically you're supposed to know just about all of this stuff on that project okay last couple things we're going to talk about anticoagulants right these are chemicals both naturally occurring and pharmaceuticals which prevent that fibrin from being formed in the first place antithrombin from the liver Heparin, which is both naturally occurring and used, of course, during surgeries in, in cases, as well as prostaglandins and prostacyclins, they prevent the clot from forming in the first place. That's a little bit different from this process, right? The reversal of the clot or clot dissolution. We can run this backwards by uh, causing a, a protein called plasmin to break the fibrin back apart into little molecules which are washed away in phagocytose. Now that happens normally as a wound is healing, but of course we can take advantage of that. So look at this, you ever heard of TPA, clot buster? TPA stands for tissue plasminogen activator, and it is often used in emergency departments to treat ischemic stroke or heart attacks, right? And you probably know something about this, Heart attacks and strokes are both caused by blood clots forming in the brain or heart, respectively, when we don't want them to. And so if we can catch these processes early enough by using clot busters, we can dissolve the clot and restore blood flow, hopefully before permanent damage occurs. Our last section, 19.6, talks about blood grouping. And here we can see the ABO blood groups. Have you ever studied this before? Kind of interesting. Do you know your blood type? Mine's A positive. Maybe yours is O negative. What does that really mean? I'll tell you now. The ABO blood group uh, is different from the RH factor. And so we'll talk about that. That's sort of independent. So your A, B, AB, or O blood type is determined by a group of genes. And then your RH factor is determined by a different group. So you could have any blend of those. What does that really mean to have type A blood? It means you have these special type A antigens on your surface. Remember, antigens are cell identity markers. Um, we use them, you know, without our involuntary way we use them our immune system uses these to know friend from foe and to know one germ from another and so uh, we have these antigens on our blood cells if you have type b blood you have a different type of antigen and if you have type a b blood you have both 
antigens. And if you have type O, you have little naked red blood cells. Don't worry, I won't tell anyone. If you are born with type A blood, later after birth, in the first few weeks or months, you develop anti-B antibodies. This is strange. Even if you've never been transfused, as an adult, you can't get type B blood because these antibodies will cause these new blood cells to stick together and they'll end up dying. You have a seizure, drooling, it's really ugly. Likewise, if you have type B blood, a few weeks after birth, you develop anti-A antibodies. I don't know why, but it just happens. It's unlike most antibody formation where you have to be sensitized to the antigen. It's just natural. Type B blood people have anti-A antibodies, even if they've never been transfused. So you have to match up this blood type, right? Which blood type can type A people receive? They can receive type A, of course, and type O, because it's not going to react with their anti-B antibodies. But if you give B or AB to a type A blood, uh, blood type, uh, they're going to have a big agglutination reaction. What about type B blood? What kind of blood can they get? Well, of course, O, the naked kind, and B. Why can't they get AB? Because they have anti-A antibodies, and that'll react. They can't get A for the same reason. If you have AB blood, you're a bit lucky because you don't have any antibodies, and so you can get this blood type, this blood type, this blood type, and this blood type. Type AB is sometimes called the universal recipient because they don't have any antibodies. They can get whatever they want. Type O, you're the universal donor, right? But you have both anti-A and anti-B antibody, so you can't get any of this stuff. You can always and only receive type O in the case of a transfusion. What happens if you mix it up? You get an agglutination reaction, and these red blood cells stick together and clog tiny arteries. You end up really sick. RH blood group, here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. If your red blood cells have a different type of antigen on the surface called the RH factor, well, then we put a little plus next to your blood type. So you can be A positive if you have the RH. You can be A negative if you don't have the RH. Likewise, you could be B positive or B negative, AB positive. Uh, so on and so forth. Now, really, the most interesting and potentially tragic complication here goes something like this. If a uh, Rh-negative mother conceives a baby with an Rh-positive father, then there's a chance the baby will inherit the Rh-positive paternal trait. It sometimes happens during pregnancy, but I think more often during labor and delivery, through placental tearing and vaginal damage of vaginal childbirth, we get mixing of the blood, and then the mom develops anti-RH antibodies. The first pregnancy is rarely affected, but subsequent pregnancies, if that baby is also RH positive, we see antibodies crossing the membrane and leading to uh, either hemolytic disease of the newborn, or oftentimes uh, this leads to miscarriage before the baby is even born. So now, thanks to a lot of brave women like my mom's mom, my maternal grandmother, we have Rogam, and you can learn all about that in your textbook. Uh, it's an antibody against the RH antigens, and so uh, moms, I think around 20 weeks or something, get a Rogam shot and helps them hold that pregnancy and prevent hemolytic disease. So an RH negative mom can safely deliver an RH positive baby, but it usually involves medical intervention and that Rogam. Here's the CBC that I talked about in the prior video, hematocrit, white blood cell count. These are all very common uh, blood tests that we'll be talking about in more detail in our lab. And so you should review some of these conditions just as a preparation for your clinicals and your pathology. Uh, maybe extra credit questions, but not technically testable here on table 19.4. Good work, everybody. You deserve a break. After you answer these questions. <laughs>